Good morning, afternoon, and evening, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to Lionfish uh, update panel uh, as part of um, uh, virtual DEMA. Uh, these updates have been a regular part of the DEMA annual uh, conference and exhibition for uh, a number of years, um, led by uh, the Reef Environmental Education Foundation and others. Um, Lionfish Universe and Lionfish University uh, is very pleased to be collaborating with DEMA to bring you the session uh, this year, uh, although in a somewhat different format, uh, virtual as is the DEMA show overall. Uh, my name is uh, Phil Karp. I'm an independent uh, citizen scientist, formerly with the World Bank, and it's my privilege to be moderating uh, this session. Uh, we have an all-star lineup of um, experts on various aspects of lionfish biology, um, lionfish market development, um, and uh, gear, gear, uh, gear testing. And I'll be introducing them uh, in turn um, as uh, they intervene. Um, we're going to run this session uh, more as a talk show style. So I'll be um, uh, bringing them in a, at different points during the discussion. Uh, we also uh, have some uh, fun activities, uh, including uh, some quizzes, some polls, uh, and a raffle where we'll be awarding uh, or giving out some really cool lionfish-related prizes. Uh, but the first thing we want to do is uh, get a sense of, um, of who we have with us today. Uh, right now, we have uh, 50 participants online, and I hope we'll have others joining as well. So we're going to go to a, 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 a quick poll to take a look at that. Uh, we're going to be pasting into the, um, the chat. You'll see uh, at the bottom of your screen a chat window uh, with a link to go to Poll Everywhere, uh, which is where you'll be able to access the poll. So please go to Poll Everywhere. Um, you can either do it from your browser or on your phone and let us know where you're connecting from. We'll give it a little bit more time because it seems like only a few people have gotten to the poll. But already I can see we have from different parts of the United States, we have from Mexico and Central America, from Europe. All right, it's great to see that we have such a nice distribution. Uh, now that it seems that uh, many of you are at the poll, we're going to go to the next question. And this is a fun one. Um, we want to ask you to put in the first three words that come to mind when you think about lionfish. Um, they're obviously, they're beautiful, but also are invasive. Um, so let's see, let's uh, generate a word cloud of the first three words that come to mind when you think about lionfish. And we'll be sharing this word cloud uh, with everyone uh, via email at the end of the session along with the recording. Dinner. Yummy.
All right. Well, that was a lot of fun. We'll leave, we'll leave this poll open. So if you want to go back to it and, uh, and put in some additional uh, words so that the word cloud grows, uh, that'll be great. But I want to move on uh, and to introduce our first uh, panelist. We're honored to have with us uh, Tom Ingram, who is the um, president and uh, chief executive of ADEMA, uh, the Dive Equipment Manufacturers Association uh, that sponsors this event. Um, Tom has been the president of DEMA since 2002, the longest serving president of the organization, uh, and has become the face in many respects of, um, of the diving, diving industry in the US. Um, Tom's service to recreational diving has been recognized uh, with a number of awards, and we're really happy to have him uh, with us uh, to say a few words about the uh, DEMA show and Dima's involvement with invasive lionfish. So over to you, Tom. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Phil. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen here, uh, I hope, and get us into presentation mode. Uh, yeah, so uh, we've been very fortunate to have you all uh, work with us over the past few years, and uh, we're extremely excited to have you here again. There we go. Uh, uh, certainly DEMA show online is a little bit different than what we've uh, all experienced in the past, but uh, very much uh, glad that folks are uh, taking to it and we're seeing lots and lots of uh, registrations that are occurring at the show. So, uh, you know, take advantage of everything that's here. Uh, certainly, the uh, DEMA show online makes it possible for all of us who treasure and depend on the ocean to continue our work to protect it. That's a, a really important aspect of all of this. And the only thing that will ever be normal is change. So, you know, we, we as an organization and you all taking the steps that you're taking uh, will really uh, lead that change now. So. Very grateful to Lionfish University, um, Lionfish Universe, for helping us uh, take these steps to, to reach a wide audience. So great stuff. Uh, there's that panel from the you know, past. Uh, and again, very much appreciate you folks doing this, but uh, we're happy to have you, these experts here to discuss this issue. And I hope we can continue these discussions through this organization and uh, with DEMA so that uh, we can make sure that we've exchanged this information. It's extremely critical. Being a Florida boy, uh, born and bred, I'm out in San Diego now, but uh, uh, having grown up in Florida and having experienced these things uh, uh, as, as the invasion began, uh, it's, it's extremely heartening for me to see that there's lots of work being done. So very good stuff. I stole some uh, photos from the FWC Reef Rangers site, uh, and uh, you can see that there's been lots of activity with the Derby stuff, and I'm not going to try to steal anyone's thunder here, but uh, we know that just recently there was some information uh, posted from FWC and from the um, Lionfish Challenge with more than 21,000 lionfish removed from the state waters over a five-month period from May 22nd to November 1st. Uh, that, that's down from 23,000 in 2019 and 28,000 in 2018, but uh, we know it's still an issue. Uh, the commission is required to submit a report to the governor and, and legislative leaders in the coming January. So we'll be anxious to see some information from that. But please take advantage of all the opportunities here at DEMA Show Online to connect, engage with attendees, uh, engage with Lionfish University. And thank you for being here. Thank you most. Thank, thank you so much, Tom. We know you've got a, a really busy schedule. So thanks for being with us. And uh, thanks again to DEMA for, uh, for giving us uh, this opportunity. I uh, just want to mention uh, to everyone that this session is being recorded um, and that uh, the recording will be shared on the Lionfish Universe, uh, University uh, website after the event. Uh, Thank you all. To to the, thanks, Tom. I want to move on to the uh, first segment uh, where we're going to be looking at uh, an update regarding the lionfish invasion and, and biology. Um, I imagine that most of you are familiar with um, the lionfish invasion, but for those who may not be, 
Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And I want to introduce the, the panelists uh, for this part of the discussion. Uh, we have uh, Alex Fogg, who is the Marine Resource Coordinator for the Okaloosa County, Florida. Um, he's led a, uh, a major study uh, collaborating with federal, state, and local governments and local businesses and shareholders throughout the region looking at lionfish uh, life history. Uh, Alex is also a, um, an active uh, uh, diver and lionfish fisher. Uh, many of you may have seen his uh, viral videos on YouTube, uh, which give you a sense of the magnitude of the invasion in terms of densities, as well as uh, his prowess as a lionfish slayer. Uh, we also have for this segment, uh, Dr. Um, um, Eileen Ullman, uh, who is uh, based in Turkey. Uh, she is the founder of uh, Mercy Marine Consulting, where she focuses on uh, invasive aquatic species, including pufferfish, invasive lionfish, and shark research, and also sells handmade lionfish jewelry, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And then uh, finally, for this segment, we also have um, Dr. Holman, Holden Harris, who is a postdoctoral research associate uh, at the Nature Biological Station of the University of Florida. Uh, Holden has been involved in lionfish research in a number of respects, also uh, is another um, lionfish slayer. Uh, and we'll be hearing a little bit from Holden on some of the issues of uh, biology. But let me turn first to Alex. Um, Alex, um, tell us uh, 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 about the current status of the invasion and also the latest um, information about origins. I know there have been a lot of stories about uh, where lionfish were first seen, uh, when, uh, how they got here. Um, tell us what uh, the latest um, uh, research shows about the invasion in the case of the Western Atlantic. Awesome. Thanks, Phil. Hey, everyone. Alex Fogg, Coastal Resource Manager up here in Destin, Fort Walton Beach, Florida. Um, as Phil kind of alluded to, uh, there's definitely a lot of theories about how lionfish got here. So for the 79 participants that are on the call, Southeast Florida, mid-1980s, 1985. That's a number you want to remember here shortly. Um, but for some of you that don't know, after we saw this major uptick since the, the mid 1980s, in 2018, 2019, we started to see quite a decline in the population. Um, there's a lot of theories about what, uh, what may have been causing that. And I know Holden will be talking about that in just a little bit. Could have been related to uh, potential disease, could have been related to a, a ton of derbies that were going on, or maybe a combination of, of both. Um, but I think it probably has something to do with the disease and you'll see some probably pretty gnarly pictures here in a minute. Um, but recently here in 2020, um, we've been monitoring the population to see if there was gonna be some kind of rebound. And what we've seen over the last few months is actually the number of lionfish have actually uh, increased on some of the artificial reefs that we have up here in the Northern Gulf of Mexico. Um, and recently I was actually diving on the East Coast of Florida last weekend and saw more lionfish there than I had seen ever before. So I don't know if that's a sign of how things are, are going to progress, but it'll definitely be interesting to, to hear. And I think uh, out in the Mediterranean, they're seeing some, some major increases in the population as well, which Eileen, I think we'll talk about in just a little bit as well. Um, that's really all I have right now. I don't want to keep uh, rambling, but if you have any other follow-ups still, let me know. Um, thanks, Alex. And that's a, a good segue. Uh, I want to invite um, Aileen. Uh, Aileen, tell us about the, um, the situation in the Mediterranean. I think people, may, many of our um, viewers may be less aware about the invasion in the Mediterranean. Um, when did it start and what's uh, the current status? Uh, hi, everyone. Okay, so for a brief overview, I'm just going to show you a little movie I made about the Mediterranean invasion. Give me one second here. One second. Where is my movie? Okay. 
Okay, one second here. Um, where did my movie? Okay, I will show you my movie in a few minutes. Um, can I stop sharing screen right now? Okay. Sorry, I have... Can you hear me? Can hear you. Okay. Um, I'll show you the movie uh, in a few minutes after I find it. But just to let you know, um, in 2012, there was the first established population in Lebanon. And then since it's just been kind of um, increasing like crazy, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, we're kind of comparing the abundances between Cyprus and Turkey. Cyprus seems a little bit more heavily invaded than Turkey, but um, in the past year, populations have pretty much exploded over here. So uh, we have this great American team. We have Lionfish Universe that's giving us amazing advice and we're starting um, Mediterranean and actually international collaborations. Hopefully we'll be able to control this at the beginning since we're kind of at the beginning now and we have so many great experts helping. Thanks, Aileen, and I'll come back to you on that uh, uh, cross-regional sharing in a couple of minutes. Um, let me ask um, uh, both of you, for, starting with Alex, um, what impact, of, if any, has the coronavirus uh, pandemic had on populations? Uh, is it affecting the ability to undertake removals? Uh, what are we seeing? What's the impact of the coronavirus um, on the lionfish situation? Well, it probably really depends on where you are. Um, here in Florida, there really are not that many restrictions as far as uh, coronavirus goes. So the diving activity has certainly taken a hit, but not nearly as, as severe as maybe some of the Caribbean countries uh, that are preventing a lot of people from going there and diving and potentially removing lionfish. Um, there's still a lot of lionfish that are making it into the market, but that is another issue as well, because with restaurants being shut down or restaurants having limited capacity, they may not be buying or selling as many lionfish as they normally would be. Um, so you would expect to see a potential increase in the population with less pressure. And that's what we've kind of seen in the last few months, whether that's related to coronavirus and the, the lack of effort or lack of normal effort, I'm not sure. Could be, you know, these fish getting used to a potential disease, could be related to decreased culling. Um, but the, the coronavirus could certainly have an effect on, on places where diving has decreased. Thanks, Alex. And I'm Aileen, gonna go to Eileen's video right now, Phil. Um, Anthony's got that ready to get queued up here. Okay, let's take a look at the, the, the video on the uh, spread in the Mediterranean. Okay, so you can so you can see 1991, we had one sighting in um, Israel and then you can see the establishment happened after 2012. Um, 2014, Turkey got saturated, the entire southern coast. Um, 2015, hopped over to Crete, even Tunisia, southern Sicily, um, eastern Mediterranean getting more saturated. 2018, um, North Africa is coming in. And then we have the western coast of Greece. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's happening really, really quickly here, especially the abundances. They basically exploded overnight last winter. So uh, yeah, we have to start control now. Great. And speaking of that, and starting control now, um, Aileen, tell us about what some of the efforts are uh, in the Mediterranean. I understand there's projects going on in a number of countries. Uh, are these country specific? Is there any kind of a regional project? Uh, tell us what's being done to uh, address the invasion in the Mediterranean. 
Um, as it's quite new, um, the only countries actively controlling the invasion right now are Cyprus uh, formally, Lebanon informally, and Israel. Um, so we have Greece, Turkey. Uh, the larger countries are a little bit harder to change the regulations to allow scuba diving, uh, spearfishing. We are hopefully starting a new policy paper soon to advise governments on best practices, uh, what has worked in the Caribbean with many of your team. So that's exciting. Uh, we have started awareness videos. Um, next, we have to get them on the dinner plates, uh, get people used to them, get, get people to know that it's a wonderful, delicious fish and not to be scared of the venom and the difference between venom and poison. Um, so we have a lot to do, but um, yeah, I think, I think the best, as I'm an invasive species researcher, I think we have to just commercialize these fish. So whether it being jewelry, um, hopefully we plan to explore lionfish leather next year with you, Phil. Um, that would be wonderful. So we have many things to work on, but yeah, I think finding, finding the proper markets Great. in the proper Thanks. country. We will in fact be talking about some of the commercialization uh, in a few minutes. Uh, I wanted to ask you one last question uh, for now, Eileen. Um, you mentioned the uh, learning from the experiences of the Western Atlantic, uh, where the invasion has been uh, an issue for a longer period of time and there have been a lot of initiatives. Uh, what are some of the differences uh, in terms of the Mediterranean um, that need to be taken into account in terms of the applicability of the lessons from the Western Atlantic? Um, yeah, we have quite a few differences here. Um, one being that we have, you know, so many different cultures and countries we have to consider. Um, hopefully getting basin-wide collaborations will be, um, is ongoing and I hope that will strengthen in the future so we can compare our data. Um, I think one major thing is that in, in Turkey anyways, people are not schooled in conservation. Whereas maybe in America or Canada, it's second nature that you want to protect. So maybe we will need some extra marketing to, you know, to suggestive selling to have people want to go and help clean the reefs. Um, so yeah, a, a few little differences like that, but we'll, we'll get her going. Thanks, thanks, Aileen. And we'll be hearing uh, on the marketing uh, efforts, in fact, in a few minutes. Uh, and you also mentioned earlier on regulation, and we'll be uh, we'll be hearing from uh, um, from uh, Ali El Haj a little bit later on regulations as well. But I want to turn now to Holden. Uh, Holden, um, Alex mentioned the uh, issue of the um, uh, disease. Uh, you know, a few years ago, there were quite a few reports of lionfish with skin ulcerations either being harvested or sighted. Uh, what do we know about the cause of these ulcerations and might they represent a disease that could lead to natural control of lionfish populations? Yeah, uh, so the disease is certainly of something of important interest. Uh, lionfish being an invasive species um, didn't seem for a while to really have much effect from natural diseases or parasitism. So they seem to be largely uncontrolled by predators and then also uh, native parasites. And we noticed this uh, seemed to have changed in uh, the summer of 2017. Um, so beginning in August 2017 in the northern Gulf of Mexico, so that's up in the Destin Fort Walton uh, beach area where Alex works, uh, we started getting reports from the commercial fishermen that we work with that um, high percentages of their catches uh, were, were, were presenting uh, with these uh, skin ulcerations. So here, I'll show you a picture uh, here to give you a better idea. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, go ahead and present the slideshow. Um, <clears throat> 
So this is from an article we published in, uh, really quickly afterwards because we wanted to get this uh, information out. And I'll post the link up here uh, online. Um, so these are ulcerative skin lesions um, that in some cases uh, present quite noticeably uh, on lionfish. And uh, there's been some collaborative research from uh, disease researchers at the University of Florida and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission uh, to try to understand the etiology of the disease. So what uh, the mechanistic driver is that's causing this disease. Um, and we have a paper for that in review. Unfortunately, uh, the findings are is that we couldn't determine uh, the mechanism that caused it. The epidemiology of it um, appears to be a virus. It, um, the way that it um, occurred and spread seems to be of um, disease origin, uh, but unfortunately we don't know whether it's a disease um, or a bacteria or a virus that's actually causing it. Um, something that we did see and study though is that um, we saw population level effects of the disease. Um, so to get you, give you an idea, I'll move here to the next slide. Um, 2017, we saw really high densities of lionfish. And I think it's better to show kind of a video of one of these really high density sites. Um, so these are uh, some of the reefs out that we study in. Um, some of them have over 100 lionfish on it. And then we uh, returned here a year later um, as part of our uh, annual sampling. And you can see there's still a lot of lionfish on this reef, certainly plenty to do uh, ecological damages, uh, but the number uh, reduced um, considerably. And we followed up with um, some wider research on this. And what uh, we estimated is that on these high density sites, uh, lionfish densities declined about 75 to 80% on these sites. They also declined on natural reefs. Um, and these, of course, have important implications for the commercial fishery, uh, which we'll probably talk about more later because that's a whole uh, segment in itself. But what's also interesting is the uh, some of the size structure data that uh, Alex and others have been working on indicated that we might see a population rebound already starting. And what it appears to be is that uh, population is starting to rebound. Um, already and recently the uh, densities are returning back uh, to levels they were be from before the disease. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Holden. Uh, that's fascinating. Um, maybe some good news from the uh, perspective of biotic controls, but um, um, then that having implications in terms of commercial fisheries. And like you said, we'll come back to that. Um, but before we go on to the next uh, segment, where we're going to be looking, in fact, at, um, at commercial markets, uh, I want to uh, invite uh, Stacy Frank, who's the uh, uh, co-founder of Lionfish University, uh, to introduce the first, first raffle. Uh, Stacy, what do we have uh, to, uh, to give away and um, who's going to be our lucky winner? Well, thank you, Phil, so much, and thank you all for being here today. This is a, a great gathering. Um, I'd like to show you um, one of our great raffle prizes, and this one will be our grand prize, and it is a beautiful sterling silver lionfish pendant. This will be the last raffle prize we'll give out today, and this was donated by Dan Knorr from Tropical Seas Land Shark, and they make skincare and sun care products, and it's just beautiful. It's about an inch and a half um, just a gorgeous piece. So, and the rules, you'll need to be present to win any of the raffle prizes. So what we'll ask is that within about 10 seconds, if your name is, is called, please type your name in the chat box so that we know that you're present. Otherwise we'll go on and select another winner. So our very first raffle prize is super special. And this one is given to us from Castawave. And Castawave is a nonprofit that Anthony Valulis, who is helping behind the scenes today with uh, the Zoom webinar, has donated on behalf of his nonprofit. And they work to restore coral reefs by planting corals, particularly in Belize. And um, he has done quite a bit of work for us. We really appreciate everything he's done. Um, the first part of the donated prize from Castawave is one of their bracelets that's made from lionfish fins. And they use these just to sell and 
and make money for their coral restoration. And then the other part, which is the super special part, is there will be some coral planted on your behalf and you will receive this beautiful certificate. And also the coral will be named after Anthony's father, uh, who just passed away unexpectedly uh, last Saturday at the age of 53. So I'd like to take a moment uh, of silence for everyone. Just please send uh, his family healing thoughts and energy. And his mother, Sonia, I believe is uh, watching today. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, and the winner of this very special uh, donation is Rebecca Gaines. Rebecca, if you could type in your name so we make sure you're here. We have a winner. Rebecca's Yay, here. Rebecca, okay. Awesome, so you'll get your certificate and your bracelet and thank you very much. All right, back to the panel. Okay, thanks, Stacy, and we'll have uh, other prizes to uh, to uh, award uh, as we go on during the session. But I want to now move on to our next segment, which we've alluded to, which is that of uh, development of some commercial markets for uh, lionfish and lionfish products. And uh, we're really, uh, uh, it's our uh, honor to have with us uh, a couple of uh, restaurateurs and, uh, and uh, food entrepreneurs uh, for this uh, session. Uh, we have uh, Ryan Chadwick, who's a serial entrepreneur, a restaurateur and founder of Norman's Lionfish, which is a wholesale lionfish business uh, committed to developing a global lionfish supply chain. Uh, and it was founded in 2015. Um, since its establishment, Norman's Lionfish has removed over 30,000 pounds of, of lionfish successfully and set up a wholesale market that supplied restaurants in over 20 states and dozens of whole food locations. Um, Brian also um, uh, has uh, opened and run a number of restaurants in New York, Aspen, and uh, Montauk. Um, he continues to dedicate a lot of his time to lionfish. And also for this session, we have with us uh, Nikos Dumpas, um, who is a Greek uh, marine scientist, but who's also been heavily involved in promoting lionfish and other invasive products uh, for consumption uh, in Greece. Um, and he's uh, really doing some innovative things. So I want to first um, uh, turn to uh, Ryan. Um, Ryan, you've been involved for a number of years in promoting uh, lionfish as a seafood item, both through, through your restaurant and Norman's Lionfish. Uh, tell us about how things are going in terms of uh, development of the uh, lionfish seafood market in the United States and elsewhere in the Western Atlantic. Hello, everyone. Obviously, my industry right now is being pretty decimated being in the restaurant business. So a lot of my time, I've had to focus the last eight months to kind of survival mode for my restaurants. Um, I'm putting everything on hold. I put everything on hold for the, for the lionfish um, kind of before COVID started, just to kind of, I've got seven restaurants right now that I'm trying to stay afloat. Um, but with that being said, we did put a model in place with Norman's Lionfish. We started it out, um, you know, had great relationships uh, with divers down in Florida. We were able to move 1,000 pounds over a few years. And um, we, we had just started reaching out to Belize uh, just to look at that market and uh, met with a lot of uh, local fishermen down there and, and, and wanted to set up an international uh, distribution network. And again, things kind of happened with COVID, so we put that on, on uh, a standby at the moment, but I'd like to get that back going soon, hopefully in the next, next six months, next quarter, or the quarter after. Thanks, Ryan. I'm going to come back to you in a minute, but let me, um, let me turn to uh, Nikos. Nikos, um, you've been mainly involved in development of the uh, market for invasives, including lionfish, in uh, Greece. 
and have been using some innovative ways of doing that. Uh, tell us about uh, what's going on uh, in promoting lionfish seafood in Greece. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure being here. Um, let me screen share my view. Okay, so um, on IC, we tried to promote. Uh, okay, on IC, we started a project that it's called Pick the Alien uh, the last year, and it's founded from uh, Glass Preservation Fund and Ionian Environment Foundation. And we are trying to promote the consumption of edible species as a mitigation measure. Um, lionfish is one of the most uh, popular uh, invasive species. And uh, we also try to make uh, informative material for uh, the public in order to understand and to know which invasive species are uh, in Greece. You can here see a poster that we have created. Now the project aims to inform all the stakeholders, which is the fishers, the chefs, the restaurant owners, and the consumers, that uh, they can eat the edible alien species. And by eating this, they can also help to mitigate the problem. And everyone from their position, they can help mitigating also the expansion of special from a uh, lionfish. The project, through the project, we have uh, visited the Onion Islands and Kiklades Islands, and we tried to promote uh, the consumption of edible species with a food truck, the, which is called Food Cartel. And we're trying to promote it with a way that more and more people can uh, try to eat alien species, invasive alien species, and edible alien species. So we tried to make it uh, like a street food. And also we try to inform the restaurant owners and the chefs because uh, fishermen already cut the species, but uh, that if there is no the market for these species, they cannot sell them. So informing the restaurant owners and the chefs that these species are edible and you have positive and you give positive effects to the environment, but you also have economical benefits by promoting these species, they can also help uh, mitigate the problem. So we can here see some uh, examples from restaurants that uh, followed the project and uh, tried to promote the consumption of edible species. And here are our tries from a, an e-book recipe e-book that we have prepared the, in order to promote the consumption in three languages, English, Greek, and Arabic. And here you can see some um, example of the food that they have been tasting, all the consumers, the chefs, and the restaurant owners in order to understand that these species are tasty, understand that this species uh, needs to be mitigated, and um, through the gastronomy sector, we can have uh, a really good uh, example and uh, really good results in the mitigation of the problem. This is it. Great. Uh, thanks, thanks um, Nikos. Um, it's you're welcome. Uh, really fascinating, and I love the idea of the food truck. Uh, maybe something where we ought to try some of some of the places uh, uh, elsewhere. Why not? Uh, we, we can learn from uh, from the Mediterranean experience in the same way that you guys are learning from us. Um, I want to ask both of you, uh, maybe Ryan first and then uh, Nikos, what do you see uh, as the biggest constraints to the development of a seafood market for lionfish? Is it the supply, is it demand, or is it both? Uh, how about you, Ryan? What do you see as the biggest constraint uh, in our part of the world? Um, the biggest constraint, I would say, is supply. Demand is definitely there. We, we get probably six or seven requests a week for lionfish. It's just um, getting consistent supply. And, you know, certain customers, certain clients want the fish to be a certain size, right? And you're going to tell divers that, that uh, we can't take anything under two or four inches. That, that doesn't make any sense the whole idea is to eradicate the lionfish so our you know our issue is obviously divers can go only go out certain times um, I think traps will definitely be a game changer for our, our supply problems that we have and I know Alex and uh, you bidding everyone's working on these solutions now and I think once that um, once that's kind of uh, flushed out we'll have uh, more consistency and then more supply and that's what we really that's that was my biggest problem demand is definitely there great thanks uh, before i go to nikos uh, on demand um you know uh, a few years back um uh, monterey bay aquarium seafood watch 
um, uh, designated um, uh, invasive lionfish as uh, best choice. Uh, from your perspective or awareness, uh, has that had much of an impact in terms of the boost in demand or was the demand pretty much growing already? That helped tremendously. We noticed a big spike in demand after that. So that, that, was, that was a great push um, and you know, much appreciated. But it's hard too when you have all these requests for it and you, you have these supply challenges. Um, if, you, if you're promising, um, you know, say it's Landry's or a big, um, a big buyer, you can't get it constantly, so it's kind of hard. You know, you have to make a decision whether or not you want to take on these big customers, and then all of a sudden they're upset if they can't get it. Thanks. Yeah. So perhaps a good lesson for Mediterranean and elsewhere is that uh, you need to get the supply uh, side in, in in place before you do too much to try to boost demand. Uh, how about in in the case of Greece and your understanding or, or knowledge about the rest of the Mediterranean Nikos? Uh, what are the main constraints to developing the market for lionfish as a seafood item? I think at first that uh, it is the supply of this uh, species, especially of lionfish. Uh, fishermen has uh, already told uh, the catch the species, but because there is no the market, they cannot sell them. Uh, on the other hand, it's that there is no demand for this species because the consumers in the restaurants are not aware that these species are edible or even they are afraid to eat this species. Especially in Mediterranean, we have many invading species that some of them are uh, even dangerous. For example, uh, the pufferfish, that it's toxic. So someone could say that um, from the noise that the pufferfish has done first, all the rest species, um, the people are afraid to eat them, even if it's edible. So it is a great need to educate the people which species are not edible and which species are edible in order to understand that uh, we have to act for every species. Great, yeah, important point. Um, in fact, some of the uh, some of the countries in the Caribbean had a similar situation where you know lionfish were sort of vilified at the beginning uh, because they wanted to have people aware of the threat they posed, and that then constrained the ability to promote them as a, a, a seafood item, but. The idea, the aspect of certification, perhaps, may be something that could be looked at in Greece and, and elsewhere uh, as a way of uh, boosting demand. Uh, the other, you know, the other um, uh, sort of um, commercialization opportunity that's been um, alluded to and we saw in a few of the, um, of the slides already is that of jewelry and handicrafts. So what I'm going to do is quickly share my screen. Um, because I want to give you a, uh, a quick um, overview of the um, situation with respect to um, uh, jewelry. You know, it's, many of you may be aware that, um, that um, you know, lionfish fins <clears throat> and spines can be uh, dried and preserved in a variety of shapes and colors. And this really results in an attractive material um, for jewelry. And you can make um, a variety of items from lionfish spines and from uh, fins and tails. And some artists are even using uh, other parts of the fish, such as the uh, operculum or the area behind the gills, uh, as well as the pectoral fins and making other items besides jewelry, such as Christmas tree ornaments and uh, um, uh, hair sterilizers, uh, stylizers, and hat feathers, uh, and the like. And also mixing uh, lionfish parts with other materials, such as coconut shell and coconut husk, and even items such as uh, bottle caps. Um, around the, uh, at least the Western Atlantic, there's clusters of production <clears throat> in Belize and Colombia, Curacao, uh, Grenada, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, as well, <clears throat> as well as individual artists in Aruba, the Bahamas, Bermuda, and elsewhere. And it's really cool to hear that uh, production has already started in uh, Cyprus and in Turkey. Um, Eileen um, showed, I think, in one of her slides, some of the really cool stuff uh, that she's uh, making. Um, this is on Etsy, which is an online platform. I encourage you to uh, take a look there. There's a number of sellers. 
Um, and the thing I want to emphasize uh, really quickly is that um, while lionfish jewelry is cool, it also actually is helping to contribute to management of the invasion uh, by potentially boosting um, the uh, incentives to fishers to remove lionfish um, because um, fishermen actually buy, sorry, um, artists actually buy the fins and spines from fishermen and this can raise the landed value considerably, but also has important livelihood benefits for uh, the artists involved, particularly if they're, you know, women in, in fishing communities um, where um, um, the take of other commercial species is being constrained by lionfish. It also has benefits in terms of empowerment for these women and acquisition of new business skills and the like. So I encourage you, if you are aware of uh, artists in your area, uh, there's links on Lionfish Universe and other work uh, to support these uh, innovative women who are uh, contributing uh, to the fight against Lionfish through their art. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, um, I think I'm going to go back to uh, Stacy for the uh, the next um, the next raffle. Uh, what do we have up this time, Stacy? Well, and speaking of jewelry made from invasive lionfish, that is what our next raffle prize is. And this was contributed by Dr. Eileen Ullman, who you just heard speak a little bit ago about the lionfish invasion in the Mediterranean. And these are handmade. They're beautiful earrings with shells and a bracelet that goes with it. And uh, thank you, Dr. Ullman, for that contribution. And the lucky recipient of that is Mary Jones. And Mary, if you are here, type your name in the chat box. And then also, I'm typing in uh, the email for Lionfish University for the winners. And please send us your, your name, your email address, mailing address, and what the item was that you had won. So do we have Mary in no the winner, No oh. winner yet. No Mary Jones yet. yet. Okay. There she is. There, there she, she is. is. Okay. She is. Yay, Mary. Okay. Uh, and I will type in again uh, the address for anyone that wins uh, how to uh, get your, your prize. So thank you. We'll go back to the panel. Okay. And, and speaking of typing in, there's some really nice uh, discussion going on in the uh, chat window. <clears throat> so I encourage you to go on in there, introduce yourself, and uh, comment because when we uh, when we share the recording, uh, you'll also be able to uh, uh, either we'll share or you'll be able to see a transcript of the chat where there's some interesting uh, conversations going on there. So I want to go on to our uh, next segment. Um, Ryan alluded to traps. Uh, because he mentioned that one of the big constraints to the development of the seafood market is reliable supply, uh, partly because of the numbers and partly because much of the removals is limited to um, a recreational or, um, or um, commercial diving depths. Uh, so we are really honored to have uh, Dr. Steve Giddings uh, with us for this segment along with um, Ali Condelmo from, uh, uh, from, from Reef. Um, Dr. Giddings is the uh, chief scientist of the um, uh, National Marine Sanctuaries uh, administered by uh, NOAA in the US. Um, he's been involved uh, in various aspects of marine conservation for quite some time, uh, really is, uh, um, in many respects, uh, uh, one of the most knowledgeable people about this invasion. And Steve has uh, really been a driver in the work to develop a uh, lionfish uh, trap. Uh, Steve, tell us about the, uh, the designs and um, how the designs are looking to address some of the concerns about traps in general as a way of harvesting fish. Yeah, well, thanks, Phil. I appreciate that. Um, first of all, kudos to all the people out there who are working on all these different aspects, jewelry, chefs, uh, regulators, all the people that are making things happen around the world where lionfish invasion has happened. And, um, you know, the whole trap thing evolved because there's so much area in deep water 
that is not being hammered by spear fishermen. <laughs> spear fishermen are great at taking lionfish out down to 100 plus feet, but between 150 and three or four or 500 feet, traps are the thing uh, to be looking forward to, I think. And um, so we've been trying to develop these traps now for a few years, and we've gone from preliminary sort of box looking traps all had the same basic design where they're called non-containment traps because they, they don't hold the fish when the fish come to the device that they're attracted to. Um, but lionfish do come to structure. So they've all been able to just attract the lionfish and then only catch the lionfish the moment the traps are full, uh, pulled. So we call them non-containment traps because they don't really bother a bunch of other species and trap them as soon as they show up. So we really get low bycatch with these traps. And that's been one of our objectives all along, not to get a bunch of species we don't want. And um, the latest of the designs uh, is something to, that we call a purse trap design. And Holden's done some testing on them. I've done testing. And a number of different people have tried them in different settings. But they're basically foldable traps that fold in half, uh, which allows them to be stacked nicely like pancakes on a fishing boat. So we can carry a lot of traps all at once. And um, you can shape them a number of different ways. Here's a frame design that has straight sides, very easy to bend. It's just made out of rebar. And it, it's called the purse trap because it ends up looking like a, a little change purse when it's closed, but in a big ver version, about six feet across. And uh, so when they're on the bottom, they just lay flat and lionfish are attracted to these central structures, these uh, lattice pieces of plastic that we put in the center of the traps. And um, Turns out most other species aren't nearly as attracted to these as lionfish are. So we get a lot of lionfish and very few else. And so we're working on different aspects of this design to ensure that the traps hit the bottom nicely and that when they hit the bottom, they open cleanly and, um, and then they don't lean off to one side too much and tip over and not open. So we're trying to refine the designs and we really are at a point where we need professional help now. We've done all the scientific testing on the traps, knowing they function well, but now it's up to professional fishermen to take it to that next step and make sure they can fish them in a professional setting in multiples, many, many traps being fished at once. And um, if that works, then we're really onto something that can meet the demands that Ryan talked about and that other people know is out there. The demand is there, it's the supply. But we also know there are a lot of fish in deep water. And this is a little quick image of deep water lionfish showing um, just, how, just how many deep water lionfish there can be. And this is about a 300 foot deep shot. So we're trying to refine these, these things as much as possible, keep them inexpensive, keep them mechanical so we don't really have electronics to worry about and that kind of thing. And they'll stay cheap that way, just to make sure fishermen will be attracted to using them. Thanks, Steve, really fascinating. Uh, and you mentioned about uh, commercial testing. I actually want to now bring in uh, Dr. Ali Condelmo, who is uh, Reef's uh, Conservation Science Manager. Uh, she joined the Reef team in 2018 and brings a wealth of experience to the organization. Uh, she's studied the population dynamics and management strategies for lionfish in the Cayman Islands uh, and Florida and Turks and Caicos, working with local stakeholders. And Ali, uh, Reef is going to be uh, actually organizing some testing of uh, the Giddings lionfish trap uh, with uh, commercial fishermen. Tell us about these efforts, uh, what depths, what topographies, uh, how many fishers are going to be involved, and when we can expect to see some results um, of this testing. Over to you, Ali. Thanks, Phil. I'm going to turn off my video just to help with audio uploads. because My Wi-Fi is pretty poor where I am. Um, and thanks for the intro, Steve, to the traps. So yeah, um, in the Florida Keys, bycatch data from lobster traps is, uh, as well as ongoing research by Florida Fish and Wildlife has shown that um, these lobster traps are capable of capturing sometimes large numbers of lionfish in the deep reef habitats, depending on the deployment strategy and the location. So we um, submitted a grant through NOAA's Salt and Soil Kennedy Program, and we've been funded for a two-year study that began in October of 2020 to test the efficacy of these non-containment Giddings traps um, in the Florida Keys with using lobster fishermen to, you know, and their expertise to help um, fish these traps. Our ultimate goal is to 
um, use their experience and expertise to finalize the de design and the deployment strategy and their operational strategy of the trap to make sure that it can fish successfully in deep water habitats in the Keys with high currents um, and able to hit targets, you know, the site locations that we want to capture. And so once that design is ultimately finalized, um, which will be sort of the first phase, first half of the project, then we'll use both the lobster fishers knowledge as well as um, a team at FWC is running um, ROV surveys in deep water habitats in the Keys. And so we'll use both of those, um, all of that information to target high density lionfish locations in the deep ha habitats. Um, and determine if the trap is actually efficient at capturing lionfish. We'll be attaching time-lapse cameras and also um, using the ROV to look at both lionfish behavior, the densities where we drop the traps, um, habituation on the traps, and then removal efficiency. And so ultimately, hopefully, determining the best soak time for the traps, the best time of day to pick them up, and how far from a source population they can be deployed and still be effective. Um, so with this project, we'll be working with the lobster fishermen, um, hopefully upwards of five um, at some, at, towards the end, we'll have the traps out on their boats. And then um, local spear fishers for the information, as well as FWC and scientists, including Steve Giddings, uh, Holden Harris, Alex Fogg, um, who are all here on the call, so that's great. And so kind of using all of our info to get these traps in the water, in the keys, um, and see how effective they can be where we know there's high densities of lionfish in deep waters. Um, we're also incorporating a local and virtual outreach component to the um, project. So through both Reef's outreach and media team and with Lionfish University's help, we'll be disseminating our findings through regional stakeholders and then also promoting the effectiveness of traps at our derbies and local events. Great. Thanks, Ali, and I'm going to come back to you uh, a little bit later on the awareness uh, aspect as well as on derbies. Uh, but you know, both you and uh, and uh, Dr. Giddings have mentioned the um, importance of traps in in terms of uh, developing a, uh, a commercial lionfish fishery. Um, Ali, I want to go back to a Holden. Holden, uh, a part of your PhD research, in fact looked at the um, development of a commercial fishery for lionfish in Florida. Um, tell us about some of the uh, key findings and um, to what extent does this, um, you know, inclusion of an of a additional type of gear for removals uh, impact on uh, that potential for uh, commercial market development? Yeah, thank you, Phil. So we've seen is that in some areas, of the lionfish invaded range, uh, these fisheries have developed. Um, some of them are recreational fisheries, um, and those have largely been encouraged uh, by these derbies and tournaments. And we see these can have a really large uh, effect and um, can improve the uh, what we see in the ecology in terms of the number of lionfish that we see on reefs. And then in some areas, we've seen evidence that this um, has positive effects in native fish species. Um, in some of these areas, the lionfish densities have been high enough to really support a commercial fish rate. Uh, mostly we've seen this in the subtropical regions where lionfish uh, have invaded. So in the northeast uh, part of Florida, off North Carolina, and then um, with the highest densities reported in the northern Gulf of Mexico, uh, particularly on artificial reefs. So these are some of the reefs like we showed earlier where you have over 100 lionfish on these small artificial reef modules. Um, like a small chicken coop. When you have that many lionfish in one area, uh, spearfishers can go down and effectively harvest a, a lot of lionfish in a really short amount of time. And so um, some of the big players in the market like Whole Foods and Halperns have come in and really started to um, stabilize the supply chain. It's interesting in a lot of areas, the demand for lionfish has increased where people want lionfish, uh, but the problem is they can't find lionfish. And the problem here is you need producers um, of that. And so you need fishermen to go out and go out and harvest flying fish. And so a lot of that has to do with the economics of the fishery. You have to have price high enough. You have to have catch for unit effort high enough uh, where it can be efficient for fishermen to make money on this. Uh, what's interesting is now we have a paradox though, because we want to create a sustainable fishery 
for people to go out and harvest lionfish commercially so they can you know have a livelihood make money from it but if you're successful in developing that fishery to the point where you're now overfishing the species now it starts to actually become less economical um, so we've done some work on the uh, economics of this and so there's a couple of key things that can help um, there's marketing that increases the price of lionfish and that's getting people interested in lionfish so it means um, the derbies outreach events that fwc does um, that jessica is a part of even uh, events like this in demo really helps to raise the awareness of lionfish and raise the price of lionfish up there's also some considerations of um, public support so these are subsidies um, that you can justify that you're using basically taxpayer dollars um, to help increase the price of lionfish because of the positive effects that you see in the ecology and that you also see on other commercially important species like snappers and groupers that lionfish affect. And then there's also um, novel ideas like value-added uh, products. So the ideas like working on jewelry um, that I know you and the World Bank have worked on um, to increase that price of lionfish can be really important. Thanks, Holden. Um, fascinating stuff. And um, I hope that uh, we'll be hearing more and you know, in, in future and in future updates about the uh, market development. And as you point out, it's a little bit of a, uh, of a, of a paradox when we're talking about uh, developing a market, a sustainable market for an invasive species. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a really tricky thing, but I think the work that everyone's doing here in different ways um, helps you kind of navigate that paradox. Yeah, and exactly. And in fact, um, you know, we've talked about the uh, fact that there's quite a number of different types of stakeholders involved. Uh, here we have this, uh, um, this session is organized by Lionfish uh, University, uh, which is an awareness raising uh, NGO. We've got Reef involved uh, and others. Um, in particular, a number of these are uh, citizen science organizations. How important is the involvement of these types of organizations in the effort? And, and what do we know about the nature of um, the citizen science involvement in uh, managing invasive lionfish? So I think they've been, it's been absolutely critical uh, from day one is the uh, work that um, divers have been doing. And a lot of this, you see these in these dive groups um, on a lot of the different areas of the Caribbean. Um, groups of people that have been diving together now get together and say, you know, we're now seeing lionfish on our reefs. Um, they've started doing research and knowing that, hearing that uh, lionfish are causing damages to the ecology of their reefs. And they said, we're going to go do something about it. And we're going to start removing lionfish uh, from these reefs. And in a lot of areas, they've really worked with the scientists where we'd say like, well, um, we can't do formal stock assessments on lionfish um, like we do for snappers and groupers and other uh, species. Uh, they're very intensive and it's really expensive. Um, and we're not trying to actually protect lionfish. Um, so to understand the population dynamics, the ecology of the system, um, what we rely on is the fish that are being brought out of the water um, by the scuba divers um, and, you know, the relationships they've had with scientists. So throughout the region, this has kind of developed independently um, and it's been absolutely critical uh, for the science and the understanding that we have from lionfish has really uh, relied on um, these ne this network of scuba divers throughout the invaded range. Great, thanks. And I want to uh, um, uh, maybe abuse my role as moderator to put in a plug for a study that, um, that Holden and Alex and a few other uh, researchers and I are going to be doing uh, actually on this question of the use of citizen science uh, in management of invasive lionfish. So, um, around uh, April or May, uh, we'll uh, be able to share the results of, of that uh, study. Uh, but speaking of involvement of everyone, uh, of many different types of groups, uh, we want to go on to our next uh, poll question to get a sense of how people are involved. So let me ask uh, Anthony to uh, give us our next poll question. Um, and you can choose all that apply here. What is your current or past involvement uh, in dealing with uh, the lionfish invasion. So it looks like a lot of people have been involved in removals. Uh, 
taking advantage of the opportunity to uh, consume uh, lionfish, which are delicious, although malicious. We have a number of people who have been involved in research. And a lot in awareness raising. And I hope for those of you who have been involved in awareness raising uh, that this update and the uh, other updates that have been provided uh, by uh, DEMA during their shows will help you uh, with that. So great, nice to see uh, uh, so much degree of uh, involvement. Um, what we're going to do now to award the next couple of prizes is we have uh, a couple of quizzes. Um, Alex alluded to this when he talked about the history of the invasion in the Western Atlantic. So we have two quiz questions. Um, type in your answer to the chat box and um, our, um, our moderators behind the scenes will determine who gets the correct answer first. So the first question is, uh, when were uh, lionfish first sighted in the Western Atlantic and where? Oh, look at those answers coming in. <laughs> it looks like Hardin was the first one to get, uh, nope. I'm sorry, Debbie Miller, Martha Miller, Debbie Miller. Hold on, they came in fast. Tom Spark. Tom Spark. Looks like Tom the, Spark. Uh, exactly. Got the first one. Is he allowed to win? He didn't put the date. Ah, well, the, the I, question was what year. Knows, the question was what it's year. Where? So uh, the, oh. we didn't specify the date. Um, so I'm going to call Tom Spark as our winner for getting 1985 okay. in there. Great. So, uh, Tom Spark, what is what did he win, Stacy? And Tom Spark has won a shirt and some stickers, and also, if I can turn my computer enough here, um, a pendant made from lionfish fins from Salty Spines, and this was donated from Alexa, who has started Salty Spines to educate divers who are interested in learning how to spear lionfish and, and learn about what's involved in it. And she teaches a course, a Patty certified course down in Miami. And then she's also started organizing some small derbies, which are pretty effective right now, considering the limitations with the, the COVID restrictions in some areas, uh, although I guess Florida, not as much as some others. But um, anyway, you can look up Salty Spines and see what all she is doing. But it's a nice, nice uh, derby if you're interested in that sort of thing in that area. Great. Thanks, Stacy. Thank okay. And uh, now we're going to go to our second quiz question, which is basically the same question, but for, for the Mediterranean. Uh, what year were lionfish first sighted in the Mediterranean and where? Eileen, you need to help on this. Looks like Roberta. No, no or who is that? I saw a 1991 Israel. That's but Eileen, is it 91 or is it 92? 91, I believe. 91. Okay, so who was the first one with 91 Israel, Jim? I'm looking. they coming in way fast. It looks like uh, Sierra. Sierra J. Okay. Okay, well, congratulations, Sierra J. You've won a really cool prize donated by Nautical Passions. And these are their fantastic, it's a rash guard and very soft SPF 50. And this particular one is a Lionfish University version, their Lionfish Eliminator Rash Guard. So um, what we'll have you do, though, well, I, I know how to get a hold of Tom, but um, with, with uh, Sierra, just I'll put in our email address and you can let us know what size. In this particular one, we'll be able, you'll be able to choose the size that you would like and uh, let us know your email address and mail-in address. So I'll type that in here. So congratulations, Sierra. Great, thanks so much, Stacy. Um, now I wanna go on to the next segment of our session where we're gonna talk about um, uh, awareness raising and um, some of the regulatory issues uh, and what's being done really to make people aware, but also to facilitate 
um, the uh, removal of, of lionfish and address the invasion in both regions. And we have um, a, a couple of additional uh, great panelists for this segment. Uh, we have Scott Gonello, who has uh, experience both in the diving and aquatics area, but also in technology, which has led him to a interesting role now in supporting efforts to reduce invasive lionfish populations through use of technology. Uh, Scott has been scuba diving since 1979 and started writing software in the early 80s. And since then, um, he has uh, been involved in a number of initiatives to combine those two aspects. He's now um, um, the CEO of Lionfish Central, where he's providing technology services to nonprofits and for-profit businesses who are working to uh, eradicate invasive lionfish. Um, Scott, one of the things you've been doing has been development of a interesting uh, app to monitor um, lionfish sightings around the world. Tell us about this and how people can sign up and about the number of current users. Uh, thanks, Phil. So, you know, when we started looking at the lionfish community as a whole, uh, we found gaps between businesses and nonprofits and divers. And we thought the best way to connect them would be through an app been apps out there before and there's still some apps out there uh, but we took a different approach we approached it from the diver side like what did divers want to use for an app and in doing so we're collecting great data that divers want to produce and keep in their own dive log and that type of thing so we have a, a there's three ways you can get onto it one is through a website um, lionfishpatrol.com has all the information right there and you can log in online or you can use a tablet to log in online. Uh, and the other ways are through apps. Currently the um, Android app is live and we're putting the finishing touches on the iPhone version, which should be out, I would hope by December 1st. Um, and at that point we'll start really producing uh, a lot of marketing for it and get divers involved. So currently, you know, this is, we're still kind of in the test phase of this. It's only been about four or five months from idea to actually bringing it to market. And we've got about two dozen divers from the Mediterranean, Curacao, Aruba, Antigua, the Gulf, you know, all over. And, you know, we've collected close to 2,000 lionfish uh, catches out of those two dozen divers in the, the last uh, two and a half months. Um, and we're getting some great data from it. And, you know, we can, um, you know, you can see, can you see my screen here? So these are some of the different charts we can do. We can do global data on a, on a monthly basis, a rolling 12 months average. We can see which uh, uh, countries are having the biggest issues. Um, we can track all sorts of things um, from that. So, you know, by, by taking this and taking all the data, uh, we can then create all these different um, reports. So as far as citizen scientists are involved, if you're a diver and you want to work with a nonprofit, you can go on the app and see what the nonprofit is doing. Or if you're a diver and you want to deal with some businesses in your area, you can do that. Or if you're a business and you want to talk to some divers for that area to get more fins or some um, fish for your restaurant, you can use the app and, and log in and find them. So the app is basically a social media app where when a diver puts their information in there, it goes to our database and they keep a dive log of all their catches, and then we can take the information and start graphing and charting from that. Thanks, that's really cool, Scott. Um, besides your, uh, really, this is a really interesting uh, app and really starting to catch on. Uh, what other interesting uses have you seen of technology to manage the invasion, either in terms of apps or uh, mechanical devices? Uh, how is the IT industry uh, helping to support this effort? You know, we've talked with a lot of students from universities, right, from some scripts out in La Jolla to uh, Georgia Tech and all, all over Boston College. Um, and they're all trying to find some of these, like, students, uh, environmentalists that want to try to do something for the environment. Um, and we, we encourage them to find the gaps in the community that need help. And I haven't really noticed a lot of high-tech stuff. Um, but, you know, we produce websites for companies, we do advertising for companies, for, you know, nonprofits. Um, and we want to take this app and 
adapt it to, let's say, the trap, right? So that we can track information from there. We want to take this app and adapt it to different countries. Right now, we're working with Curacao and Aruba. They don't really count fish. They take measurements. So we want to add that feature to those countries. So when you log in while you're catching there, you have to answer those additional questions. So this app will evolve to the entire industry, however it's needed, um, and, and hopefully be on the forefront to help you know, produce more technology for, for this industry. Cool, thanks. Uh, I wanna switch gears a little bit now um, uh, to talk about some of the regulatory issues. And this was alluded to, um, I think, by um, uh, Nikos and um, Dr. Uman in their presentations. Uh, and to touch on that, I want to introduce um, Ali uh, El Haj, um, who is a founder of um, uh, uh, the company based in Sarasota that has developed Zookeeper, which was the first uh, puncture resistant um, containment device to hold venomous lionfish once they're speared by divers. Uh, he's also been involved in helping to promote um, the uh, removal of lionfish in various jurisdictions. Um, Ali, one of the important steps that's been taken in various countries to address the lionfish invasion is modification of laws, rules, and regulations to encourage divers or fishermen to remove lionfish. Tell us about some of the types of regulatory changes that have been enacted and the strategies that have been used to get these changes through. So hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. Um, so a, a lot of the regulations have not changed uh, throughout the world. Um, the main regulation would be the, the ability to spearfish while on scuba, which is the easiest way to remove um, large amounts of lionfish in the waters. What we do see happening is um, governments will kind of like look through the fingers and allow for lionfish removals with the use of a pole spear while on scuba. Um, the laws the, that a lot of countries have, the, those laws that don't allow scuba diving and spear fishing, um, to change them would take an act of parliament, which takes a lot of time. So one of the things that we've I've done in the past is instead of working with the elected official, I went to the civil servant. So in other words, the federal prosecutor who's going to uphold that law and um, explain to him the situation. It also helps that the federal prosecutor is a scuba diver and understands what he's seeing while he's scuba diving. Um, and a simple uh, press release was all it took to get all the dive community to start hunting lionfish. Um, a press release that says the law will be upholded to the full extent of it um, if you are caught with anything other than lionfish. Um, so that's a big step forward while, while the elected officials work on the addendum or the changing of the law to include removal of invasive species. Thanks, Ali. Yeah, so important point there that uh, often it's uh, administrative regulations or, um, or prosecutorial uh, announcements that can actually um, be as important as any change in laws or formal regulations. Um, you know, one of the concerns that is often raised with respect to relaxation, relaxation of gear restrictions to encourage removal of lionfish and other invasive species is the potential that this might be abused and result in removals of other species, particularly those that may be endangered or protected. What would you say to governments or others who express um, such concerns? So, so that has a lot to do with the lack of enforcement um, in areas where there are laws that don't allow spearfishing. Um, so it's, it's hard for them to change the law or to allow spearfishing because of the fear of poaching of other fish other than lionfish. And it's, it's totally understandable. Um, in, 
areas that I've lived, poaching did exist. It was currently happening while we were trying to get um, um, permission to be able to remove lionfish with the use of a pole spear. The, the big question here, and it would, it, it would be something that people like Holden or Alex or Aileen, um, marine biologist Nikos as well, would probably have a better answer to is how bad is poaching in, in comparison to allowing the lionfish just to run free and, you know, as prolific as a predator as they are, um, what would be the difference? You know, what's, what is the better odds here? I, as a, as a hunter, as, you know, someone who's really focused on lionfish, think that the poaching that may exist by allowing pole spears in the water with scuba divers is gonna, is a lot less damaging to the marine environment than allowing lionfish just to go free and decimate your native fish population. So, but, but marine biologists have the data that might be able to, you know, actually show it in, in a scientific paper, which probably has more um, weight to it than just me saying it. Um, right. Thanks, thanks, yeah. Alex. Important point and uh, one that perhaps is uh, uh, something to put on the agenda for uh, some of the research that's being done. Uh, I, I, uh, we don't have time for me to uh, to turn to uh, Aileen or um, Holden on this, but uh, important point. So the other aspect um, that I, we want to talk about is uh, efforts to uh, both raise awareness, but also to incentivize removals through different types of uh, organized uh, events. And we have um, um, a great panelist to talk about this, at least in the case of Florida. Uh, we have uh, Jessica Valick, who is part of the Florida Wildlife Commission uh, FWC Lionfish Control Team. Um, she's uh, transplanted from Minnesota to Florida uh, and to pursue her career in marine biology uh, and has been involved with FWC since November of 2019, uh, focusing on lionfish education and outreach. Um, Jessica, tell us about um, what's going on uh, with FWC. Have you been able to continue uh, efforts despite the uh, COVID situation? Um, uh, how are things going with FWC, which has been a great promoter of, uh, of uh, lionfish removals over the years? Um, yeah, so for the most part, um, we have been able to continue with most of our programs. Um, unfortunately, you know, when COVID first hit and we were very unsure of what was going to happen, we did have to put a hold on a few of our programs um, and it has um, affected our funding um, somewhat. We normally were, you know, we initially were going to um, try to get some big research projects started, uh, but unfortunately we had to cancel that and postpone that. But um, Otherwise, for the rest of our programs that we have, um, we've been able to run with them. Um, so I'll show you guys my screen real quick. Um, so we did have the Lionfish Challenge, um, which happens every year. Um, uh, this year, it was a little different. Um, normally, we would start it around the time um, of the Lionfish Removal and Awareness Festival, but that did um, end up getting postponed and then ended up getting canceled all, like, overall. Um, so what we did is we started the challenge around the same time as we normally would have on May 22nd, um, and it would have ended in September, but we decided to extend the challenge out to um, November 1st, uh, just to give people, you know, more of a chance to participate um, since a lot of, you know, these uh, tournaments and um, the festival was canceled. Um, but so really what the Lionfish Challenge is, is it's just really, it's a large tournament, essentially. Um, people compete for the top spot to get the most lionfish, um, but you're not 
a loser if you don't get the top spot. Um, we do, you know, award people with prizes um, for their harvests. Uh, it's a great way to encourage people to get out and harvest lionfish. And even if, you know, you can't get out all the time, um, you still get prizes as you go on. Um, so that did just end on November 1st, but we had a lot of awesome prizes this year. Um, the winners, the top dogs, they each got a Perdix dive computer, which I think was a pretty good prize. We gave out tanks and pole spears, zookeepers, um, a lot of good stuff. Uh, and then normally, you know, to the challenge, there's always been a different component. So one year was a tagging component. Um, one, I think last year we did uh, the largest lionfish and smallest lionfish. Um, and so this year what we did to keep it interesting is we had mini challenges throughout the challenge. Um, so they would be a short period of time, we'd announce it right before, and then people would compete and submit their fish during that time. Um, and I'll just quickly go through um, our results. So we had great participation this year. Um, overall, people who submitted lionfish, it was not higher than what we've had in the past, but we had over 600 registered participants, um, which is definitely the most we've ever had. Um, you know, throughout the whole challenge, we removed um, over 21,000 lionfish, which is great. Uh, we did get reports of a lot of people saying, you know, that they wish they could have participated this year, but they weren't able to with travel restrictions um, due to COVID. So I think in that sense, COVID had an impact on the program, but I don't think it really stopped, you know, our participants from getting out um, because scuba diving is, you know, kind of a solo activity. Um, you don't, you're out on the water and as far as we know, COVID does not spread through the water. Um, and then, you know, just on the slide here, you can see our recreational winner and our commercial winner. Um, David Connorth is out of Jupiter and Isadora Bedoya is out of St. Augustine, Jacksonville area. Um, and one really interesting thing that, you know, we thought about looking at this year was to see how like per county, per area, how many lionfish were removed. Um, and so we actually, you know, our largest numbers were down in the Keys. Um, we have a lot of participation down there, but also, um, you know, Alex had mentioned earlier that along the Atlantic coast, he saw a lot more lionfish than he had expected to. Um, and most of our numbers came from the Atlantic coast. Um, in the past, it's been the Panhandle Northwest Florida, but this year we saw quite a bit it over on the East Coast. Thanks, thanks, Jessica. Uh, let me go back to um, to Ali Condelmo. Uh, Ali, you know, you talked about the trap uh, involvement of Reef, but Reef has been involved for a long time uh, with awareness raising, organizing derbies, and the like. Um, tell us about the current situation. Has Reef been able to continue with its derby activity and awareness raising? Um, yeah. Let me just stop my video. So in 2020, we did have to cancel two of our derbies, the uh, spring and the summer derby in Fort Lauderdale um, because of COVID. But, and normally um, we have, as part of our larger Keys Derby in September, we have a big festival component to that, which includes like 30 vendors, you know, tastings, chef demonstrations, live music and games and stuff with kids down at Postcard Inn. And we canceled the festival portion um, in 2020. However, we modified the event to um, uh, make it a two-day fishing event with a contactless drop-off station at Reef Campus. And we had really great participation, uh, actually the highest number of registrants for any of our Reef Derbies for that, that Derby in September. We asked the registrants why they registered to try to get a feel for whether it was because of COVID or any, or different, we, we offered uh, discount rates this year, um, and it was sort of split, but we ended up with 50% of our participants were actually new to the Derby, so that was really great to recruit in new members. And um, despite Tropical Storm Sally running through during the second day of the event, we actually had um, the most lionfish brought in for one of our uh, Keys event ever with 13, over 1,300 lionfish brought in in one day of fishing. So that was really exciting to be able to still run that event um, despite all of the restrictions on travel. We partnered with Moat Marine Lab down in Summerland Key, which allowed for a lower keys drop point, which helped bring in some um, southern teams into the competition. 
And then we also um, created two category divisions this year, a sort of competitive apex predators category and then a reef defenders category. So I think that allowed for some amateur teams to come in. Um, and ultimately, uh, we still were able to do some outreach and education through that event with live public streams that reached over 8,000 people. Um, we had a James Beard award-winning chef, Chef Alan Sussier, that came down and cooked some lionfish for the reef team, and we live streamed that. So um, despite um, a lot of restrictions, it ended up being really successful. A very wet and rainy and windy successful weekend, but successful. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, these derbies and outreach events um, continue to bring in new members and new participants. Um, they actually are getting bigger for us each year, which is really exciting that people still really want to participate and it allows for stakeholders and participants sort of co collaborate at this joint event and really communicate. And so our biggest struggle is not getting people engaged or running the events. Um, we struggle with getting sponsors for the um, cash prizes. So if anyone out there wants to sponsor a reef derby or any of the organization derbies, that really is like the hardest challenge of, you know, continuing to fund those um, incentive prizes so we can keep building those, those derby events. Great. Thanks, Ali. And speaking of prizes, I think, um, Stacy, we're going to go to our last grand prize uh, raffle item. Okay. And this, well, actually, we have one more after this. Okay. What we'll do is we'll do the grand prize right after the questions. Um, this next raffle was donated by Scott Ganello, who you heard just a bit ago, talking about his new Lionfish Patrol app, which will be super useful. And he's also uh, has a nonprofit, Lionfish Central, to help lionfish organizations. So the prize winner for this one is Robert Drake. And Robert, are you here? Please enter your name in the chat if you are here. That is Robert Drake. No Robert yet. Okay, no Robert Drake. We'll go on then. If Robert is not answering, I don't think we're getting Robert. Okay, um, then in place of Robert, oh, there, wait, uh, there he is. Oh, He's there. Robert, He's there. you got yeah. just in time. Okay. That's what size he wants. Uh, oh, and you do get your size, Scott says. So, uh, what would be a good size for you? Let us know that. And then I'm going to put up again our email address for any of the winners. Please send us your name, your mailing address, your email address, how to get a hold of you, um, what you won. And if there is a size, uh, I, I know a couple of things do not have choices, but the Lionfish Patrol shirt and the Nautical Passions shirt does. So let us know that. And Sierra, I hope you sent got the information too about our email addresses, lionfishu at gmail.com, but I'll enter that again for everybody. Thank you guys. Great, and then the final grand prize. Oh, uh, well, let's wait till after the questions from the audience okay. for that. So um, we've been uh, receiving a number of questions through the chat window, uh, and I think we have time maybe to take uh, two or three. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, Jim Hart uh, from Lionfish Universe uh, Jim, give maybe you could read out a couple of questions and who they're directed to, uh, and we'll invite those panelists to respond. Uh, there are so many. Uh, Weldon, are you still with us? Is Weldon still with us? What about Jessica Harvey? Is she still with us? I think Jim, best if you just read the questions and who they're. Well, they're they're, they're, they're uh, here. Yes, Jessica, could you type in your question? I see you. We've got so such a long line of chat. Can you type in your question again? Sorry. Uh, let me find. Uh, Weldon is not here. Uh, we had a number of people referring to uh, the programs they're involved in. Craig Putnam um, is advising an undergraduate senior capstone engineering project at Worcester Polytechnic Institute for several years to develop a fully autonomous robot for harvesting lionfish and would be interested in connecting with any of the panelists regarding this work. Uh, um, this is what we're mostly getting is this kind of people are actually um, are actually involved in programs that are seeking 
our, our help on. Okay, here's. Hey Jim, just to say there are a few groups working on uh, the robot yeah. ideas. So uh, we can probably connect them with some of them if they're interested, if they're not already connected. Um, there was a question about, uh, has anybody developed uh, a lure or um, a hook that's um, um, effective in catching lionfish? I think Dr. Giddings can answer that. Yeah, well, yeah, either Steve or Holden can address that one. Uh, maybe uh, Steve first. I typed in something saying basically it's not about the hook really, it's about the fact that lionfish don't seem to be attracted to bait like regular fish do. So, which is why we use the, la the FADS, the fish attraction device, rather than the baited trap. But you really don't catch them that often on hook and line in general. So I don't know that there is a real potential there. Alex may know better and Holden, it, maybe they could comment. Um, yeah, Holden? go ahead. Um, I've heard of people catching lionfish, but it's so rare that um, it really doesn't seem to have any impact on their populations. I know there's a researcher down out of uh, Nova Southeastern that went out on a mission to try and catch lionfish on hook and line. He actually caught quite a few out in about 200 feet of water using live shrimp. Um, certainly wasn't enough to, to make it a commercially viable option, but if you want to do it, you can go do it as long as there's lionfish there, which I think every reef has them. Uh, Jessica now has, has anyone done research on how the injuries heal after escaping a spearing incident or the uh, he, uh, healing of the lesions? Holden? Alex, do you want to comment on that? Uh, there's no formal done? studies that have been done, but uh, for lionfish that had the, the skin disease, there's plenty of them that are that are surviving and healing. Um, on the population monitoring that we do every month, we note how many have an active lesion or one of those raw lesions that Holden showed you earlier. We also note how many have a scar or a healed or scabbed area where uh, where that lesion was persisting. Um, as far as lionfish being able to heal from being shot, you see a lot of that too in places where there's a lot of hunting going on and they're actually able to, to survive a, a a spear hole pretty well as well. Thanks. Uh, Thanks uh, Dan, Dan, Alex. Danielle, I got one more here that's important. Danielle DeCool is in Citizen Science. What data points would you suggest citizen scientists collect from lionfish caught? Maybe Holden, could you address that? Oh, that's a really uh, great question. Um, and I would say from my research, uh, the important thing would be, I think both the amount of lionfish that's harvested and then to um, keep a consistent track of the amount of effort, um, you know, in terms of number of dives or um, I think the easiest thing is just to track the number of dives to get those lionfish. Um, because what you can see is sometimes a lot more lionfish get pulled out of the water, but we don't know if that's just because more people are actively diving them. So a really good index is what we call catch per unit effort. So if you're catching 20 lionfish per dive, and then over time you see that you're catching five lionfish per dive, even if more lionfish total are coming out with more people, um, we can use that as an indicator to see that uh, populations are indeed declining. Holden, we have that in the Lionfish Patrol app. We do bottom time, the amount of fish you catch, natural environment, um, the average depth, uh, and then we can calculate that. So like right now, the, the Mediterranean Sea, the average catch per diver per dive is about 23 to 25. So you can see the hotspots from there. So there's plenty of information to fill in with the app and it's a free app, every diver should be using it. That's, yeah, that's, that's great. And I would just add to that, if you wanna be ambitious uh, is to um, uh, include uh, dissections of a sample uh, of those uh, to look at uh, prey composition, uh, which is something that's been being done by a number of the organized uh, citizen science groups and also as part of derbies. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, of questions and comments coming through, and uh, we are going to um, uh, provide a transcript of the chat um, as part of uh, what will be posted on the Lionfish University website, and also will address uh, questions that haven't been answered during the session. So rest assured that uh, we'll be able to get to those. But we're short on time, so I want to turn back over to Stacy. Uh, for the uh, final raffle before I invite uh, Jim uh, to give us some uh, concluding remarks. Okay, and now for the grand prize raffle. 
We've got drum roll here. Okay, this is our beautiful sterling silver lionfish pendant. It's just gorgeous. Donated by Dan Noor from Tropical Seas Land Shark. And the grand prize winner, thank you, hopefully you're here, is Jasmine Ferrario or Yasmine Ferrario. And Yasmine, if you're here, type your name in. Where are you, Yasmine? I hope you're still here. <laughs> The $500 piece of jewelry. Are you here? I'll give you a moment here. Yasmin. Yasmin. There's not or two of these to give away. There's only one. Just one. Okay. Well, if Yasmin's not here, we may have to go on to somebody else, another lucky person then. Um, Yasmin, we'll give you a couple more seconds here. Okay, um, we're gonna go on to Jennifer Solomon. Jennifer, are you here? Type your name in if you're here. Dr. Solomon. Yay, okay. <laughs> Jennifer, you are the grand Yay. prize winner of this beautiful pendant. So I think you probably already have the information where to send everything or your information to us at lionfishu at gmail.com. I will type it in again. So yay, all right. Thank you for hanging in everybody. Turn you over to Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Stacey, uh, for these great prizes. And uh, let me invite uh, Jim uh, on behalf of Lionfish University to maybe give us some concluding remarks. Uh, we now have 71 people uh, who have uh, signed in. So this has really been awesome. Uh, well, thank you. So, thank, you for, thank you for hanging uh, in. I'll, I'll, I'll keep this short and sweet. I'm going to invoke Dr. Steve Giddings, who pointed out to us that um, there is a silver lining in this ecological disaster. Um, and I would simply say there's a simple test you can, you can, uh, it's a question you can pose to yourself right now. And it's how has the lionfish invasion changed your life? Who on this screen would you never have met because of the lionfish invasion? How many friends do you have in your circle of friends that would be eliminated if it weren't for this invasion? Um, uh, and in terms of changing life, Ali al Hajj was not a scuba diver when he invented the zookeeper. We've had industries pop up, we've had chefs pop up, we've had food um, sources pop up, we've had jewelry being made, uh, we've had lifelong uh, friendships made because of the lionfish invasion. So in that respect, even today, we welcome our Turkish friends, our Cyprus friends, our, our friends from Greece. We never would have met these people had it not been for the lionfish invasion. So that's the, that's the, good, that, that's the good thing. The last thing is that Alex Fogg always says, Lionfish are bad, but they're good, bad for the environment, but they're good to eat. Is that right, Alex? Did I get it right? Oh, you were on the phone. But just ask yourself that question. How has my life changed because of the lionfish invasion? Uh, it certainly changed mine. I started out being a screenwriter, and I was going to write a horror film about giant lionfish, and nobody knew what a lionfish was. So now maybe I can write that script. But I want to thank all of you. Uh, and thank Dima uh, for being a part of this. And, and let's hope that we can do this again. This is the beginning of Lionfish Universe. We're now a global uh, organization, a global network of friends and colleagues and scientists and citizen scientists. So thank you very much. Eat them to beat them, kill them and grill them, trap them and snack them, and anything else you can think of along the way. So thank you on behalf of Lionfish University. And thank you, Phil, for uh, uh, hosting this today and everybody who's involved. Yeah. Thank you.